Hello everyone, welcome to the session with this music you one would expect a video or something like this, yeah? but uh, it's just us today. Um, so thank you very much for being um, here in time and so expectantly quiet, to be honest. Um, that was um, impressive to see um, that uh, I think some, maybe some school teachers would be um, interested to see how that works, that everyone gets quiet, we have to see how that works. So um, we have an interesting session, an interesting panel um, ahead and um, we um, now even have our last panelist. Thank you very much, uh, Jill, for joining us here at the table. Um, we want to discuss outbreak response teams and have um, the little bit um, um, challenging question, is this a solution or um, is it also a neo-colonial approach? And we want to discuss that. Um, the experiences with such outbreak um, teams, the benefits, but also the limitations. My name is Andreas Gielstorf. I'm happy to share um, this session. I'm uh, currently working at the Robert Koch Institute, the National Public Health Institute in Germany, where I am the um, chief of staff um, to the um, president. Um, but why I'm here is because I um, had the honor to um, lead the German um, epidemic preparedness team for two years before that role. Um, and with this, um, I um, have some experience um, also uh, like other colleagues here. Why are we discussing um, this? Um, I think we have seen in um, recent years with, um, I would say, with a big push after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that um, there have been various international rapid response teams that have been established and then also de deployed regularly to um, assist um, especially low and middle income countries when Ebola, but also other hemorrhagic fever, um, there was a big um, Search and push during um, during Corona with a lot of support um, there as well, and it's unquestionable that there has been a lot of success in this area, but. Um, um, we also um, see that um, it's sometimes a bit challenging really to see long-term um, effectiveness. Um, there's always this, the question about the sustainability of these efforts and um, maybe that's not even a fair question and maybe we can discuss this as well, that rapid response teams need to have a long-term effect. Um, could be interesting, um, but there are definitely expectations that we, um, that we face there. And um, there are also questions um, whether sending rapid response teams is, um, to low and middle income countries from the global north is still appropriate or necessary. Um, and if this is really helping also um, to build uh, local capacity. Um, and again, we can discuss if this is exclusive or can uh, support each other as well. And this, of course, is all um, with the current discussion, especially, especially I think, uh, fueled again during during Corona with the um, vaccine uh, distribution, the equity questions, and really the questions on some neo-colonial awareness that has risen. Um, and there, we definitely have to um, con yeah, discuss among ourselves how the um, how this um, how these approach of the re um, rapid response teams um, work with that. So I'm really happy um, to have here five um, good panelists with me. Um, we have um, Gerd Krasen um, with us. Thank you very much. He's the chair of GORN. Um, most of you might uh, know GORN. That's a, national, a network of over 300 multidisciplinary partners um, who prepare and respond to outbreaks. And it's um, hosted and coordinated uh, by WHO. But um, that's just one of her jobs, her current and normal job is uh, she's one um, of the directors of an international clinical research network, ISARIC, um, at the University of Oxford and also chairs the um, WHO Europe Preparedness 2.0 um, Technical Advisory Group. Then we have um, Jochen Flassbart. Um, he is an economist um, at the moment. He is State Secretary at um, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, before he was in a similar role in the Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. And uh, before that, um, he headed the Federal Environment Agency in Germany. Then uh, we have Ngozi Rundu. She's uh, currently the technical director at the Global Institute for Disease Elimination in um, 
Abu Dhabi and um, she's also the co-chair of the um, O'Neill Lancet Commission on Racism, Structural Discrimination and Global Health. Um, and um, she, but with this important topic, she, um, she combines um, many years um, of experience in preparedness, control and response of epidemic prone um, diseases and uh, support in improving um, com um, IHR capacities. Um, then, um, for those of you who have uh, the book open, might have realized that uh, we don't have uh, Gulmira with us today, but uh, luckily um, John um, could, um, could step in. Um, we, John is um, the current co-chair of the Lansing Commission of One Health. Um, he's from um, Ghana and is the group leader of the Global Health and Infectious Disease Research Group at the KCCI in Kumasi in Ghana and um, has um, experience from hosting um, one of the rapid response team deployments in, um, in Ghana. And um, so, so had Gulmira and we were happy that, we found that John could uh, step in with his experience to share that a little bit with us. And then, um, um, last but not least, Virgil, um, he is the currently executive director for the ECOVAS Regional Center for Surveillance and Disease Control and was previously the team lead for health emergency preparedness and response in the same center and technical advisor on rapid response teams in the Western African Health Organization and has established there or helped establish regional rapid response teams. So we have different levels where we want to look at the um, the possibilities of rapid response teams, the challenges, the benefits um, as well. And now that was all we did in standing. The rest will hopefully be a good discussion. Um, we have decided not to, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure all the panels have these expectations to have a lively discussion that is uh, engaging and not necessarily just um, starting with, uh, with a lot of um, input information or frontal information. But we try um, today really to have a discussion also among us and I encourage here my panelists um, also to interact with each other and maybe challenge some of the points as well. Let's see if we get that far. Um, but um, I think it's, um, it's really important to look, um, um, when we look, I mean, when we, when we are in the field and supporting as rapid response teams on the different levels, we um, are um, confronted with a lot of expectations and a lot of um, requirements. And um, some of them are quite challenging when you're on the ground. Um, and I think um, this experience, it would be definitely good to discuss a little bit here from the different um, perspectives. And I would love to zoom out a little bit and therefore start with um, um, Jochen from um, the BMZ, your ministry is commissioning the ZEG, the German Epidemic Preparedness Team. Um, when you advocate for something like this in the um, in the in the Parliament, um, what 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 are, is the political motivation for keeping such a um, team that is supporting other countries? Um, how do you convince the parliamentarians to fund something like this to to to, to help other countries? Do I have to push it? No. no, no it's, uh, it's uh, so, hello, everybody. And um, yeah, I mean, we do have such a, a, rep is, a rapid response team. You mentioned it, SEEG. And um, when I committed myself to this uh, panel, I didn't know that you were leading this um, uh, group. So it, it makes me a little bit nervous now because uh, you know everything about it. And um, but you were asking for the political uh, motivation. I think number one is a, a little bit uh, simple. Um, it's in the genetics of de development cooperation uh, to help other countries, to support other countries uh, in crisis uh, beyond uh, humanitarian aid. And once you have an outbreak, this is exactly the situation where you look, what can we do? Uh, and uh, to provide expertise where there might be a lack of expertise is, in my view, an appropriate um, uh, well, approach. And um, we will get deeper into it, uh, whether where, where the deeper roots of the need for such kind of uh, support uh, lay and what difficulties and problems they might be accompanied with. And the second one is more a selfish one. 
um, I, I think more than at the Ebola time when uh, the SEG was created. Uh, 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 the latest with um, COVID-19, the world understood uh, that we are talking about, when we are talking about global health systems, we are talking about a global public good. Uh, nobody is safe until everybody is uh, safe, and that's, of course, also a motivation to fix uh, outbreak situations in partnering uh, countries. Yeah. And uh, that is convincing, obviously, to parliamentarians, even in difficult times. I, I, I believe that, but I, it also has some implications, I think. We may be yeah. discussing um, later a little bit, because, it, of course, it is uh, looking back at, at the needs of the, um, at the um, providing country or the, 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 um, the country that is, that is um, 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 bringing up the um, or kind of exactly this uh, having this um, rapid response teams um, I want to like I said I, I uh, move um, a little bit higher now when we look at the regional level uh, from your experience um, what would you say now we have national teams we you um, were essential in building up um, regional response capacity what would you say are the benefits of having such regional um, response teams, but also maybe the challenges of, um, of that from your experience. Okay, can I go on? Yeah, of okay. course. Thank you so much. Um, I came from a, a region of the world where we usually say all protocol observed before start speaking. Um, I think it's truly a benefit to set up a regional rapid response teams. And our experience with the West African Health Organization started just after the largest uh, Ebola virus outbreak in 2015-2016. And we set up the regional rapid response team not to duplicate national efforts, but rather to support uh, national uh, rapid response teams in place. So we one of the lessons we have learned in West Africa after the EVD outbreak was that we need to build rapid response team systems. It means that we need to work in a such a way that we build, uh, we strengthen the system, and we also have uh, a sustainable uh, 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 rapid response team systems in place. And the regional systems come in. Uh, in a way that it it enhances the regional collaboration among member states, but also it brings a kind of uh, local solidarity in the regions uh, and uh, offer opportunity for peer learning and also a benchmarking between uh, member states. Another important thing is that it's sometimes very difficult for one country, especially in the low middle of income country settings to have all capacity in place. So it's, it's, we, we offer opportunity country to come together to mutualize efforts. So for instance, uh, Togo can leverage on some capacity in the neighboring country like Ghana, where they can work together to respond to an outbreak at the border, for instance. It's easier to do that from a regional perspective rather than each of the country deploying resources from both sides of the border. So there are a number of elements in the international health regulations offering opportunity to leverage on uh, regional capacities to deal with public health emergencies. So we try to build uh, regional rapid responses around those various items. That's what I can say to, 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 to start this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, then I think it's, it's, it's already a good point when you say not all countries can uh, keep the, the capacity and resources. Um, I mean, one could um, discuss if this is a temporal situation that we hope to overcome at some point. Um, and then that would also maybe go to, to um, you, um, Gail, from, from an international perspective now. Is gone just a uh, fix um, till we have the capacity available on all, um, on, in all countries? Or do we need to keep regional and international mechanisms uh, for all time in, in, in place? What do you think? I think we're seeing a, a transition occur um, on the back of the height of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, 
that's certainly hopefully shining through in the new Go Arn strategy where um, we are moving more towards Go Arn being at that local level um, for preparedness and response. Um, so hopefully we'll see a transition phase where, for example, through new WHO convened initiatives like the GHEC, the Global Health Emergency Corps, and um, a couple of us were just in that meeting, um, where they've brought together all the big pre-existing um, networks, including IAMFI, EMTs, GORN and others, um, and socialising that idea with the, the countries um, to try and listen to the country needs um, and support them as they build up their rapid response capability. So I think there is a, a, a correct, a righteous transition that's happening. Um, you know, obviously there's what, something like 30 countries in the world that remain vulnerable or in conflict and that fluctuates and there's 31 countries currently facing cholera, you know, a disease that's been around for centuries. We've still not dealt with that one. Um, and some of the ministers were saying it's challenging for them to, to look ahead, um, to, to get on board with these new initiatives when they're facing ongoing protracted emergencies in their own countries. So I think um, there's still a place for Gorn because I think if there wasn't, our membership wouldn't keep increasing. I mean, Armand's here, uh, manager from the operational support team at WHO Geneva. We get new members every week, including 70 national public health institutes. Um, so clearly there's still a need for us and we don't impose ourselves, at, you know, we are requested for assistance, but there are other things we do. We've been, you know, running training courses um, on that team based approach and more recently with RKI on leadership um, for the past 15 plus years. Um, Gorn's been exi in existence for 23. So hopefully that 23 year period of building trust across multidisciplinary institutions from all over the world will see us through or chaperone us through a transition period where I think it is absolutely imperative that the country needs um, and their sovereignty um, and their leadership and their ownership is at the centre. And also as part of that is that engagement with their communities. Um, so at the moment, I think there is still a need, maybe who knows and how long in the future there may be less of a need. But at the moment, there's, there's still a need. But we look forward to contributing to this period of transition. Yeah, thank you. That's a good perspective. Um, John, um, I already mentioned before you in um, Ghana, in Kumasi, you received um, the support of uh, the, the ZEEK um, a couple of years ago. Um, what's your experience? Um, how did, did the team help you with your issues? Um, can you still see some impact of what has been done um, when, um, back then? No, thank you very much. And, and once again, uh, greetings from where I sit in, in Kumasi. Um, and to go straight to answer your question, and then maybe I take a, a little detour. Um, the, the team came in uh, during the Ebola crisis and this was based on what was and truly was a clear and present danger for Ghana in particular, because Ebola had struck in, in Guinea and then also in Sierra Leone and in Liberia. And uh, Ghana is host to the largest Liberian population in Africa outside of, of Liberia. Um, Ghana also um, had or still has several flights daily um, from Europe coming in and leaving, and also had direct flights uh, from New York and from Washington, D.C. coming in on a daily basis. So when the modeling was done, it was very clear that if there was any next in-line country at risk of Ebola, it was Ghana. And this is what mot mot motivated uh, the, the team to, to come to Ghana through uh, the, the late Professor Christian, Christian Meyer. Um, and he had significant experience working in Ghana, working with us at uh, uh, the Ken USC and at KCCR. So his coming um, was, you know, together the team was seen as more of a, well, this is already a part of the system. He wasn't seen as an outsider, really. And um, some of the others who also came along with him as part of the team had had some previous experience uh, working in Ghana. And so it was very easy to integrate. 
um, the the benefits of that are still being felt today uh, in the sense that uh, you know that glove box that was brought along uh, to the KCCR <laughs> was still used uh, for uh, for COVID. And I, I can hear one of our virologists, Augustine, I can hear her chuckling at the back there because she used that glove box. And um, one of the team who came, she was originally from Mali, is actually still based with us in Ghana now as a research group leader um, and so on. So the benefits of those uh, are still being felt today. Thankfully, that no case emerged in Ghana. So one could argue that maybe that's a success because then uh, if, if nothing happened and no news, mm -hmm. the success of public health is no news. Mm -hmm. So that was, good, that was good news. But I mean, if I can just take a quick step back and I know you'll come to this, I mean, the whole concept of, you know, stepping in to help, uh, you know, is the premise of that and maybe maybe i'm jumping the gun here but the the premise will differ from from place to place uh, and uh, i think being able to drill deep into that i'm sure that's what we'll get into very shortly mm -hmm. is what i'm very interested in uh, looking at in this panel because countries do receive help for different things in the u.s when they're in trouble they'll get help from canada you see the canadians trooping in to help uh when there are earthquakes in in turkey and People go and help, and these are otherwise fairly wealthy countries. So that tells you that everybody needs help and will need help at some point in time or the other. But especially for disease, and, and this goes to what Virgil was talking about, um, these pathogens do not know borders. And so it is very clear that even if a country has so-called capacity, it is wise to ensure that there is some level of collaboration with others, mm -hmm. whether it's in a rapid form or a slow form, but collaboration is absolutely cannot cannot be cannot be done away with so there will never be a point where we'll say now we have it all so we don't need anybody to come in and help it's not going to happen yeah no definitely very important points um i would remember still also experience that it was um, especially for diseases that um, are likely to spread yeah that there is also quite some resistance and reluctance then from countries to provide help because they want to focus on their own preparedness which is also what is needed at the same time i think we will maybe um, step uh, um, um, encounter quite some um, com competing um, expectations and int uh, interests in this discussion as well yeah, from different um, parties and i think they they unfortunately steer um, a lot of the um, the challenges we have around uh, the topic but one other challenge we might have um, Ngozi is um, that um, I mean with your experience from infectious disease epidemiology and supporting countries all over the world with um, in in the different um, diseases um, do you have the feeling also from your background now from 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 the um, co-chairing of this of the board um, is is that really um, helping self-empowerment? I mean, John now, I think, mentioned two nice examples where there, there came something that stayed also, yeah? Um, but is other rapid re response teams really um, help for self-empowerment or is it not also something that keeps dependency alive? alive? Thanks so much for the uh, question and also for the invite for the, um, the panel. I think this is a topic that we've needed to speak about for a long time, and so I'm glad that we're speaking about it now. Um, I think, you know, just to answer your question, and we talked about this a little bit before we started, is that this is not like a black or white issue. It's not a yes, you know, international um, RRTs, uh, they create dependency or no, they do not. It's quite nuanced and I thought it would be useful to kind of talk about what are the potential neo-colonial elements of rapid response teams that come from outside of a country, um, just to start us off for in, in this aspect. Uh, I think one of the reasons, I mean, um, you talked about the German rapid response team and how you know one of the primary objectives is to support countries, and I think that's that's right. Like when you're going into a country, I think it's important to you know the objective is to disrupt the transmission and and protect the local population, and then the secondary objective to me should be to build capacity and strengthen skills, and I think when we go in, which we have for a very long time with like the global health security lens only, which usually we like you said, not just in Germany, but in the US, in the UK, that lens is off, also often used to for, for governments to give money towards international development, right? Like we, everyone's inherently selfish. And I, and I think that makes sense. But 
when you go in looking, okay, we just need to make sure we contain this outbreak so that it doesn't come out to our countries. So obviously, that's not the right approach, and, and it's you can see through that, and the countries that are there can see through that, and I think that is perceived as quite a neo-colonial uh, approach. I think off, also the assumption that our first like point of call is international expertise to me, that is just that builds on this foundation of uh, supremacy and inferior, inferiority. Um, all the good ideas do not come from the global north. All the good ideas does not come from you know wealthy white majority countries. And so I think that we all know, especially after COVID-19, that outbreaks are local, right? So if something happens in Berlin, it's very difficult for somebody in you know uh, Sydney to say, well, this is how you should do things. The first point of contact should be the Berlin, and if they don't have the capacity, the skills to do so, then I would think the next part. I I, I don't know enough about Germany to like tell you where Berlin is actually located, but <laughs> <laughs> but the next what I I would assume would be the state or the province, um, state. State, yeah, thank you. And then, you know, and then from there, then national. And so I think that's the same in every country, right? Like uh, there are some countries in Africa, even though they're low, low resource, that have a lot of experience when it comes to outbreak response. Um, and and they can handle certain things. But then there might be specific things. Maybe it's a specimen, um, a specimen transport. Or maybe it's like very specifically, you know, gaps in contact tracing that they may need support. And the next point of call doesn't have to be the U.S. It could be if you're in Nigeria, the next point of call uh, could be Ghana or it could be, you know, uh, ECOWAS. And so I think we need to start thinking like that. Um, instead of international, regional, national, local, it's local, national, regional, international. Um, I also think when international teams do come, I think there needs to be a quite an awareness of the power that they hold. You know, one thing that I would always ask is, you know, when I hear some of my colleagues not not very happy with international teams, well, like you invited them in, so like what is the problem? But the power there's power in money, obviously. And like when when a when a country needs support for something specific, but you have to give everything else with it. So a, a more concrete example, um, you know, one thing that's very clearly neo-colonial is going into a country, supporting with the outbreak response, and then taking all the data back to your country, which happens all the time. Not just, you know, written data and digital data, but also specimens and, um, you know, blood samples, all of that. Um, and that's wrong. Like, no country on earth would be happy with that. Uh, but that, that, is, that is a common occurrence. And when I uh, was part of the outbreak response in Guinea, um, I saw that happen as well. And so I think there needs to be some type of supra entity, whether it's a WHO or if it's a regional level, Africa Union, Africa CDC, or ECOWAS or SADAC or whatever. We're talking mostly about Africa here, but obviously there could be ASEAN or PAHO as well. Um, that has some type of parameters, you know, principles. There's things that you can and cannot do. And there's also things that you need to do before you get into a country. Uh, one reason that the Guinea uh, Ebola outbreak um, was so kind of catastrophic at the beginning is that some of the folks that came in to um, help respond to the outbreak did not know about the ethnic makeup, did not know about the religious um, practices, and did not really consult the, the national um, uh, counterparts as well. Um, and that prolonged um, some of the, the hotspots there. Um, and then finally, I, I said I said this in my last panel, if anybody was there, about like, I think global health should be global, right? Like, you know, I've been on Gorn's uh, database for a very long time and I have been, you know, deployed. But I, other than language, like, you know, French speaking countries, I don't see Gorn, you know, deploying, you know, uh, Kenyans to help in Canada, right? You know, I, it, it seems just so one direction, you know, it's like LMICs need all the help. Now we know from COVID-19 that's not true. Like everybody needs help. And like there are very specific examples, some monkeypox, for example. Nigeria had been responding to monkeypox, examining monkeypox, researching monkeypox since its recent reemergence in um, 2017. But there was this lack of consultation um, from Niger Nigerian experts. Um, and well, we all know what happened with monkeypox. And so I'm just saying, like, it's not, if it's really, like, the Gorn, I think the G in Gorn is global, right? That, I think that it should actually be global. Like, we should, I think the um, kind of hierarchy of intelligence 
is neo-colonial and, and it doesn't need to be there. And so I think those are some of the things to look out for. I think there are very good examples and I'm happy uh, to share some. I don't want to talk too much, but um, I'm happy to share, you know, some that don't do as these things that I've named right now. But I think it's useful to kind of have the understanding of when we're talking about neo-colonialism in RRTs, like what does that actually look like? I'm sorry to barge in. I just wanted to. Uh, you know. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a point that she raised, um, and for me, just reflects what is really necessary here, which is to understand what the capacities are. Uh, anytime there's a rapid response kind of uh, intervention, and 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 this it does not only apply to the global north. Because I can give you a very interesting scenario. There was a meningitis outbreak in Ghana, some parts of Ghana. And uh, just because I, I don't want to mention names, but one organization came in. It, it wasn't German, by the way. Um, <laughs> one, one organization came in. And uh, they, they came in with rapid response, and they were taking samples, and they were going to do some tests um, in in another country in in Africa. Actually, in West Africa, I can tell you, they were taking them to the to the MRC in in Gambia, mm -hmm. right? And when I heard about it, I was like, "Oh, come on, guys! What do you want to do in the MRC? We actually can do it right here." Mm -hmm. So I personally called the then Deputy Minister of Health and said, "Look, <laughs> we can do this here." So it's okay, we're going to work on this back and forth, back and forth, nothing happened. Okay, so here was a rapid response helping. They had been let in, but there was clearly no understanding or knowledge of what the capacity was locally. Mm -hmm. They were not taking it to London, they were not taking it to, uh, to Toronto or to Berlin. It was right uh, next door in West Africa, mm -hmm. but it could have been done in house. So the, 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 the concept of understanding what is really, um, what capacity really exists is important. And maybe because of the comments that Ngozi made, I can pick on, on just a few things, if, if you would permit me, with your permission. Very well, yeah. So, so just, just the, whole, the whole idea of this rapid response is based on the premise that help is needed. So the question must always be, is the help really needed or not? But that's not for me to answer. Then the premise that we, those coming in, can actually do better than those in there. And yes, yeah, sometimes it is true. Somebody coming to help can do better than the one who is there. This is why help is needed. But is this always really the case? Then it can also be a premise that, okay, we are adding on to what you have so that together we can win. All right. And there's also another premise that, okay, uh, we want to join you. You can do it on your own, but we want to join you to do this so that we can also learn so that when we're in a similar situation, we can all do better together. At the end of the day, it's still people coming in. But what is the premise? Mm -hmm. This is always the question. I mean, the, R, the first R in the rapid response team or RIT is this rapid uh, part as well. Yeah? And some of the things you are, both of you are bringing in that are absolutely important take knowledge of the situation, take understanding of the situation, take sometimes even um, gather information about capacity, about expertise that is already there to bring and fit really in the right things. That very often that takes quite some time. Yeah? And um, I, I think um, that's, that's, um, that's always a challenge if you then want to help rapidly in a way. And I think one of the solutions could be at least really to, um, to really also map more the local expertise that is in the network available. Yeah? Because I think beside the knowledge, also the trust is a key issue about uh, helping fast. Yeah? If someone just comes in from outside without any connections, um, especially in an outbreak situation where a lot of uh, trust is needed, is, is quite challenging. So definitely necessary, but I think that requires quite some previous preparedness, investment um, and planning yeah? and um, not pre-made teams that can just deploy um, what, they, what, what, what they were trained with necessarily. Okay. Yeah, um, just, to, gosh, so many good points um, came up there. But again, just to re-emphasize that um, we are overseeing this period of, or engaged in this period of transition, and we are aware of some um, bad behavior that's happened in the past. And um, if I hear about that type of behavior on my watch, um, 
it'll, it'll be dealt with, I'll tell you that much. Um, and, and I remember being deployed a number of years ago to a central European country on my own um, for GoArn. And I, was, I integrated into the, the WHO country office, but I integrated with my clinical team. I'm a hospital clinician by background, including you know, trying to engage with the night shift staff who are often um, forgot about, forgotten about. And I, I used to say to WHO, whenever they wanted me to attend a Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever meeting, I'd say, have you asked the such and such nationals from the Central European country? Because actually, Anything I know about CCHF, I was taught <laughs> by them. Um, and, and I think um, the G and Global should include the European countries that are low and middle income country partners. No disrespect to my African family. Um, I see a lot of John. Um, but, but, you know, there are 11 countries in Europe that are listed on the Wellcome Trust list as low and middle income countries who I have to say I, um, are, I think, often underrepresented and quite often not at these types of um, tables, um, which I think is, is, is also unfortunate. But I think this is where the transition period um, and that, um, for example, GoArn being local is more about that longer term um, investment by our partners who are ideally already in those countries um, so that they own and contribute to the ownership of their national preparedness and response. And we see that with a number of our um, partners and countries with w, um, ministries with WHO country offices organising GoArn national or regional meetings. And in that instance, I've been at a number of them, um, GoArn's just acting as a catalyst of bringing together, yes, all the GoArn partners in that country with the ministry and the WHO country office, but also with partners in the country who aren't GoArn members, but they should be involved with preparedness and response for that country. I don't care if they never join GoArn. The main thing is we've acted as a catalyst to help them strengthen their preparedness to ensure a more rapid response um, that they will lead on. Um, I think the, the integration component um, is very important. I do think um, that that should come naturally through respect for the partners that you're working with and the fact that you understand that you're, under, you're in their country and under um, their sovereignty. Um, and as part of this go on going local, we are pushing more for regionalisation. I can't even remember the last time I was in WHO Geneva. So any travel I, I try to do for GoArn, I try to either be at country meetings or regional meetings. Um, no disrespect to the, the WHO Geneva family. Um, but, but we are wanting really to see that strengthening at the, the country and the regional level and also something we've coined strategic grouping. Because, for example, the Brazilian Ministry of Health want to lead on a Portuguese speaking um, sub-regional or cross-regional network um, for GoArn, and, and we welcome that, and, and who better to do it? Um, so, so there are changes happening within um, GoArn as well as, as we speak, and I think, I think they're good things. I think we are evolving. It came out of a nine-month um, engagement with our partners. It involves scenario planning, um, surveys, external stakeholder interviews, etc. Yes, we probably could have done more. We probably could have interviewed more people. Um, but I think it's hopefully moving go on in, in a good way for the future and for this transition period that we're all part of. Thank you. And I think from, um, from my experience, I would also say what you're describing right now is going beyond the direct only response driven organization really more also having that still of course as an as a as an offer where it is needed yeah. but using the skill set that is there really to in, in enhance the preparedness yeah. in the countries and i think that is from my perspective really necessary but again sometimes competing interests yeah because um, then then the commissioning party sometimes then wonder what we're doing in a preparedness setting and not in a response setting where we were set up for especially na the national um, organizations but johan you had there yeah um, i mean um the way we are looking at it or let's say how i am looking at it is exactly um when you i think it was a small little phase in your in your intervention and you said from your experiences back in 2015-16 and you were describing the experts coming from Germany 
uh, and that it was quite easy to integrate them. I mean, that is a key sentence. Who is going to be integrated where? And, and obviously, you had the self-understanding, which is important, uh, that you invited someone, you asked for help, uh, uh, but you are in the driving seat. And uh, you, you said uh, there might be bad behavior. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, it's not so difficult to understand what is right and what is wrong. Come on, that is not rocket science. And taking samples or data uh, from a country where you had been invited to help, to take them back home or to the neighbors or where, wherever is so obviously bad behavior. Uh, and um, uh, and there is another issue, of course, uh, I, I just I don't want to broaden it too much, but I just want to mention it one time, because uh, uh, again, I think uh, John said it, uh, that there are other countries uh, who need help, not, not uh, necessarily developing uh, countries uh, in the US or an, after an earthquake or all these mm -hmm. uh, situations. But looking at the world as it stands at the moment, there is a disparity, and uh, usually it's uh, developing countries uh, who need help uh, and support because it is rooted in, in the history. Uh, and um, and the, the, the key is that we have still an uh, unbelievable inequality in the world, mm -hmm. and the, we were not able to reduce it. And, and it's one of the issues that drives me crazy, to be honest, that during uh, COVID and now the um, phase of the Russian war of aggression uh, against Ukraine, these two crises alone, in these times, the richest people of the world became richer and the poorest became poorer. And that is at the core uh, what we are talking about. Again, I don't want to widen it, but we have to have this in, in mind, that we are not talking alone about the health sector or in other uh, fora about the, the food security. It all is origined uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area. Uh, but b back, um, uh, back to the rapid response, I think there are some, apart from being aware who is the, the NVT, uh, who has been invited and who is a host, uh, I think there are also some qualities uh, needed for, for this rapid response. And one is uh, that, of course, uh, it, you are part of the local expertise. Uh, and uh, in the best case, uh, if there was a gap in expertise, which is obviously the basis for a request, uh, after being there or after leaving, uh, uh, the lack has been reduced. So you leave something there. Instead of taking samples uh, back, you leave some knowledge there. And uh, uh, maybe my, my last point on, on this is uh, we should not underestimate. I mean, you, you are much more experienced than I am. Uh, maybe you can agree with all these uh, interventions, let's call it like that, people are moving from one place to another and getting in contact with other experts. And in the best case possible, they create networks uh, and uh, enhance global knowledge and, and also global cap capabilities to respond. Thank you. When we look at, um, I think we look uh, international and national support again. Um, I want to come back to the to the regional um, approach that was also is also mentioned as as a. I would say a bigger focus the last couple of of of, of years really to um, to make it more likely that there is similar expertise, there is a better understanding, and maybe a faster um, help possible as well. Yeah, from your experience in building a regional um, response team, how um, how how was your experience? How easy it is to get experts from one country being released to be sent to another country and then fitting well in into the into the hierarchy there so f f even for the short time they are there yeah that they're really in this in the normal command chain structure um, did that work or do you have there examples how how that worked well and okay. thank you so much i think it's a it's a bit tricky and uh, there are a lot of factors to be taken into account because the way it happens on the ground is more complicated than what it can appear when we are describing the theory of deployment of teams on grounds. So uh, at regional level, there is a kind of uh, acceptability and mutual 
trust that needs to be built between countries. And it happens from the beginning. What we have done in West Africa is to bring countries to talk to, or to, talk to each other, to recognize similar cap capacities around profiles that can be moved from one country to another, to be acceptable by each side. And we push countries for a protocols to, an SO, to develop also an, an SOP to, to ease this kind of deployment. I have to recognize the effort of GIZ through BMZ actually that have supported us to develop this first SOP at the regional level that have been accepted and adopted by all countries. But an, an important thing that come, an important challenge that come on, uh, that we face on ground is, was the, the flag. Some of the country want to come to the neighboring country with their flags that they come to help, they come to support. So it has not been accepted by the neighboring countries. But when it's come from the perspective that we are learning together, as what uh, uh, John has explained, that we are learning together to face a common challenge in a such a way that when it's crossed the border, we also are ready to provide the same response to protect you. Because our communities, of course, uh, your communities. So when it's come like that, it's more acceptable. And we have seen some NCDC team in Nigeria being deployed to respond to Lassa fever in Liberia, for instance. We have also seen Senegalese team going to Sierra Leone also supporting outbreak response. So, but it's countries usually accept when it's directly, it's a direct exchange. It's not known by the public. And also, it's come through the mutualization of regional public health organizations. That's important factors we have took into account. So the good SOP is key. The uh, agreement between countries, the mutual trust, and I will add actually a strong preparedness and readiness phase. Having training together, having simulation exercise together, having logistics of support together, talking to each other. To, to each other also have had to a lot. Thank you. Yeah, very good points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a little bit tricky question maybe to follow up. How are your these regional programs funded? Are they funded by by the countries, by the regions themselves, or are they often still funded with development um, money in a way? So keeping is not a sustainable funding necessarily, even though it should be a sustainable uh, mechanism e established. So it, it's a good one. It's not a tricky one. It's okay. a good one okay. because it's because it's, it's uh, always a challenge everywhere. That I think the best way to address this one is to make sure that a regional rapid response team is based on national rapid response teams. So. It wouldn't be a team we put somewhere where we are building capacity, they are standby. It should be within the health systems, people based in the public health system doing the, the basics. Another important thing for bidding on the sustainability point you are raising is that we shouldn't be going on ground in replacing national capacities. What we are giving to a country, what they are missing to improve the response, because we trust that there is there are local capacities to, 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 to be leveraged on. At the moment, we have been, I can say, very lucky. We have had GIZ supporting us. We have had Redisse project, the World Bank project, also supporting some of the, the countries to maintain rapid response team at national levels. But important thing is that ECOWAS, as a regional public health <coughs> organization has also committed money at the moment. And that's what maintained the team in place, that maintained the structure and the system we have put in place till now. And we keep advocating for that to continue. So I think it's a good mix. But another important thing, and that one is a call for teams from Global North when they are coming to support Global South, is for them to understand that Whatever is your positions, you have responsibility to build national capabilities. It's even easing the work for the team from the north to provide the correct response. And also to have good entry points when for, um, I can say, future outbreaks. So uh, we, we need really to find ways 
to learn collectively from lessons from joint responses. But what you observe on ground is that teams from the north are mostly interested by the response. But the post deployment phase, the deactivation phase, which are critically the learning phase to improve the system, they are not there at that time. Absolutely, and I think this is also due to different projects, different funding streams, different... Uh, I think it's... If, uh, from my experience, I think the people in the response teams know that very well, yeah. but um, it's often that their task is to respond yeah. just in this moment, yeah? And it's difficult to find people that stay already for six weeks somewhere where yeah. it's normally uh, good and not only two weeks or something like mm -hmm. this, yeah? So really all this logistics about that is a nas a national, a a another thing. But absolutely right, I'm not arguing against it. I'm just uh, knowing from experience that uh, knowing these wisdoms does yeah. not necessarily lead to, um, to improvements already um, immediately. I, I come to you, John. Um, Ngozi, I, I mean, we're with all this discussion. Um, I mean, it's it's good that we are moving maybe from international organizations flying in or national um, flying in into more ideas how we can build um, longer term capacity in, in in the country. But it still feels like these are not really. Um, equal partnerships yet, I would say, between um, um, what, what is offered and what, uh, who's receiving. Ha do you have any ideas how we can um, further improve that in the area of rapid response teams? Yeah, um, I think Virgil named some things that I thought, oh, if those things are in place across the board, whether it be regional or international, that will improve um, yeah, I guess the equity of partnerships, you know, like the MOUs and uh, the agreements. And, um, but I think I, I really liked strategic grouping. And I think just being strategic full stop is really important. I mean, there is a place for international rapid response teams. I, I definitely think so. But as we've said, I think if, if I think if one, you leave with one thing, it's that it should be informed and it should be specific. It's just not throwing people there. You know, in, in Guinea, like, I'm clearly, I have an American accent. I am American. Like, I, when I went there, most of the Americans there did not speak French. I mean, what, what so what are we doing? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, what, what'd you say? <laughs> yeah. And so, thank God they brought Canadians in. I speak French. But, like, they brought Canadians in, um, and they were super helpful. And Canadians came with a very, not just with the language, but with the approach, right? With the, with the um, respect, uh, you know, and, and collaborative spirit. I'm trying, please, Americans, don't bash me. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> this is what happened. Um, so, and, and I'm sure some Americans were excellent. I wasn't there the whole time anyway. So I, I think, that, I think it, to me, it's about how we do things. I think when we talk about global health equity, we talk about uh, partnerships, equitable partnerships. It's the how, it's not the should we or should we not. Like we, global health is about global health. It's about partnerships. And I think just like, you know, I worked with um, Ianfi on a project and I, I had the, the, the pleasure of working with, I think it was, it was Robert Koch Institute. Um, and it was also, I, I think there was um, the Danish, uh, I don't remember the name, but the, I'm sorry. The Danish National Public Health Institution. Yeah, okay. And, you know, the way they work with each other, that's how we should work with every country, right? It's just like you don't assume that the Danish people know less than, I hope you don't assume that the Danish people know less than the Dutch people. You work in partnership and with respect. And I think that that should be the same. It's really not that hard to, I think, understand. You should have that same type of approach when you're working with people from around the world. So I think that just centering dignity um, is really important in these partnerships. Um, I did want to give a good example. Um, so. I think the Guinea um, example um, for Ebola, I think it started off shaky, but in 20, by the time the international support left at the end of 2016, and, and there was a real focus on like strengthening surveillance um, and, and also strengthening national public health capacity, because Guinea was very strong in clinical medicine. They had like a good medical school, but they didn't have a national public health entity. Um, and the 
uh, Ghanaian lead, uh, Dr. Zakova, I believe that was his name. Um, he started this National Public Health Institution afterwards. And then in 20, so we all know what happened in 2014, 2016 with the West African Ebola outbreak and how many lives were lost um, then. But in 2021, the e Ebola was uh, an outbreak reemerged re in um, Guinea and Zarakore in the forest region. And the response team was almost exclusively Ghanaian. And I think that's what we want to see, right? You want to see that capacity left. You want to see countries being able to take care of themselves and not being dependent forever. And so there is a role. And there, in some countries, it'll take longer than, you know, this was, you know, 2016 to 2021. There are other countries with even lower capacity. But I think that the response has to be appropriate to the capacity. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think this is really a, a very nice example um, that we could um, try to implement further. But I mean, beyond beyond also maybe the the boxes in our in our heads, I, I also encountered that, that just as an other difficulty that uh, when we want to in, encourage South South calibration or have in our national response teams also experts from 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 other settings uh, from 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 the area or from the region. Sometimes there's also depend. It, it doesn't. Uh, we have different parts of the world here, yeah? but there are also some preconceptions who can help and who should help in each country. Yeah? So, and um, and there is unfortunately also still some perception that then the. The global north brings the expertise and is more welcome by some of the partners in in other countries. Yeah, and I think there's another barrier we have to 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 break there. Um, also, um, even in the in the hosting countries and um, and, and populations. Um, I cut you, John, before what? No, 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 not at all. No, I, I, I was just really um, intrigued by some points that Virgil made, which uh, I think Ingozi has already spoken to some of them, but. He made mention of uh, this, the desire for visibility and then uh, coordination. And I think the coordination part is what Ngozi has spoken so uh, eloquently on, uh, this ability to coordinate. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to go to Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. This was at the tail end. And I got the chance to really engage with the leaders there. And uh, they told me some nice stories, but at that time, most of the stories they told me were not very nice about you know rapid response teams that were very very siloed in the approach mm -hmm. and sometimes literally fighting for samples for precious samples uh, to ship all right uh, but we all know this it's not a surprise it happened right <laughs> and um but this lack of coordination among rapid response teams also tends to be really really uh, disastrous mm -hmm. but it comes and this is why i was very intrigued by virgil's uh, statement from a desire to be visible um, and we see this from the dot 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 people, a gift from so and so, and, and only in rapid response, but it, nearly in exactly all development support. Ex ex so, exactly yeah. so. So well, okay. Everybody wants to be known as a good person. That I did this. I provided the rapid response, and we are very good people, and so on. But it looks like the desire for visibility sometimes ends up being um, harmful to the overall intended impact of um, a rapid response or, or any support for that matter. So I had never thought about it in that way until Virgil talked about this, wanted to come the flag and visibility. So I may ask, uh, if you permit me, I mean, for those who are responsible for deploying people, how do governments manage this desire to be seen as we are the helpers, this is how we use the taxpayers' money to help others, and so on and so forth, with this you know, negative impact of wanting to be visible. Definitely one of the competing expectations against rapid response teams, I can tell you from experience here, yeah? really this coordination, coordinating where it shouldn't matter who is help giving the support and even it shouldn't be visible who's giving the support. Uh, rega compared or com the, on the other side, it is really this, but we have to show how we spend our money, how uh, how we can advocate for more money in the future and all of that. But maybe, Jochen, you can add to that from a political perspective, <laughs> as this is a very political discussion. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, um, if this drives you, then it's a matter of self, uh, lack of self-confidence. Because, and we, I was confronted with that when I took office at, at development. Uh, I w even didn't understand it uh, about uh, how to channel the vaccines. 
um, uh, we had Act A and, and COVAX, and uh, so there was a debate, uh, not, not so much in Germany, I need to say, but I heard it from colleagues, uh, who wanted to channel uh, the vaccines directly. I mean, with the signature of the president or the prime minister. Um, this vac dose, number of doses are uh, saving so many lives in whatever country. Uh, and I think, uh, of course, uh, there is a political need uh, to convince our societies that what we are doing in other countries is right. And this is shrinking. Uh, also in my country, uh, I, it was always mainstream uh, in, in Germany. Development cooperation was outside political competition, more or less. Uh, and uh, it's not so much the case now. There, the nationalists, the populists are coming up everywhere, uh, and they are questioning it. So I don't uh, ignore that there is a need to outreach and to explain to people what you are doing. But I here I really would say efficiency first. Whatever helps in the best way has to be done in th this very best way and coordinated way. And then uh, if you are capable uh, enough as a politician, uh, then you will find your ways uh, to explain that there is also a German or a French or a US share in, uh, in this help. So it is, uh, uh, it is not, uh, again, uh, rocket science, but uh, it's uh, important to discuss about it because we are seeing it. Uh, uh, my minister, Svenja Schulze, and, uh, and we were coming from the environmental uh, sector. So th this was all since decades multilateral. Without multilateralism, no, no progress thinkable. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, specifically in these times, and with whomsoever I'm talking from the UN system, uh, they are complaining that we are pledging earmarked money for X, Y, Z instead of core funding uh, institutions, uh, UNICEF, UNDP, UNFP. Uh, and, and, and I'm on, of the conviction, if we have interests and, and it's the right to have interests, we can channel them into the governance decisions and, and then make yourself visible and make your point. Uh, but uh, I think we need to strengthen the multilateral system, uh, WHO, Gavi, in the health sector and, and, and others, uh, and then be part of the debate to, to well, make these organizations uh, as capable as ever possible. I would love to challenge that, but Gail, maybe I'm not sure you are going to challenge that. Um, I, I, I will challenge it, sorry, because yes. I, I'm not sure you will do that. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I'll give, give you a chance afterwards. Um, are we really? Yeah, this is, this is horrible. I know, I know, I know. They, they will never ask me again, I think. <laughs> or you will never come again, maybe. I don't know. Um, I mean, how much? How much overheads are we willing to invest in, in, in this? Yeah, because every time we invest into multilateral, we invest in, and we, we spend a lot of money in an in, in organization that not direct, I would say there's not a one-to-one -one output of the money we put into. Hmm? And now you can challenge me. <laughs> um. What I think I'm hearing is a, a number of examples of polarity. Um, Virgil and I were on the Goarn leadership course recently, hosted by RKI. So one of the things they were teaching us about was polarity. Um, and it's that tension. And quite often the pendulum spins, um, sorry, swings between you know one end to the other. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that one is right and one is wrong. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a... Um, it's something you see in a complex situation. Um, and instead of trying to solve the problem, sometimes it's about managing those polarities, which in turn, once you've accepted that and you've accepted their viewpoint and their viewpoint, it can make you think differently about the situation, the complex problem that you're both facing, but to have a slightly different opinion of. Um, and, and I think that's where we need to move to. You know, maybe it's, it's less about do we have rapid response teams or not. It's maybe more about, you know, how do we have the rapid the international or the regional with the national? Um, how do we move that forward um, to invest in, you know, rapid response teams, but at the same time deal with the struggles that many of our countries are seeing with, you know, the burden of cost of living, etc., on the back of, you know, the pandemic, which obviously is ongoing. So I think... 
um, instead of seeing it as this versus that, it's yes, they coexist. What can we do about that where we can all be winners to try and move the complexity forward or to understand it better and then deal with it? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> But, it's, but it sounds, it's, uh, I mean, it's always uh, <laughs> good to hope to um, ease the, the, the pain of complexity, but um, I think not always you can do that by pleasing everyone. So I think there no. must be, um, there, there will be also limitations to that, I think, yeah. and there must also be but decisions it's, it's, be it's taken at some point. It's not about compromise. Yeah. Um, I think with sort of iterative thinking, you try and find an improved solution. But I think my basic understanding of managing polarity is it's more about managing that whole system and thinking differently about those challenges. But the final thing I wanted to say was one of the hardest but most important lessons I learned at the first outbreak response I ever went to, which was Ebola Uganda 2000, was there's no room for pride in our ego. And I think, echoing what you've said, and I think what I'm hearing from my colleagues over there is there's too much of that in the world, but it sounds terribly old fashioned and it sounds too simple and it's not particularly sexy and it doesn't need a, ro need a rocket science to figure it out or, you know, or, or whatever, or the Nobel Prize. It's basic and it's at the core of surely who we are and what we should be trying to do and how we should approach each other. There's absolutely no pride, f no space for room nor ego in an outbreak response. And if that's there, you've got a problem and it needs dealt with immediately. That sounds like I want to have you as the dealer with that in such a situation. <laughs> Gozi. Um, I kind of want to respond directly to what you said um, right before uh, Gail started, but just just so quickly about what you just said, Gail, I, you know, common sense is not common. Yeah, true. It, it just isn't. And, you know, and, and um, Joachim, um, how, how do you pronounce it? Jochen. Jochen, okay, thank you. Um, same when you were saying there's a, there's, it's clear what's right and wrong. It's not. Like, it should be, but it's not. And I think we all have these experiences. They're real. Like, you know, it, it was status quo to take data. It, was, it wasn't actually, no one thought it was wrong. Good people didn't think it was wrong. So th that's why I really like, you know, SOPs, MOUs, like, you know, us really building that into the system um, so that it is clear. So just to say, I wanted to say that. But just about the investment, um, I am even when WHO goes up and down, I am a WHO fan, and I do agree in investing in multilateralism, but you know, my colleague, uh, Emmanuel Gogol, he used to be at a Resolve to Save Lives, I think now he's at Find, and he, he asked me, you know, how come we won't pay $20 for local volunteers, but we can pay you know, $10,000 for someone coming from outside? Um, and not just $10,000, it's like you $10,000 for the flight, and then it's like the hotel, and then maybe two weeks for Gorn, but a lot, of, at least for Ebola, a lot of people stayed three months, six months, you know, that's a, that's a lot of money. And I, I, I do think we need to be thinking about evolution, and we do need to be thinking about, you know, even, I think it was just, uh, I think you really well described, like, the political environment that so many countries are in, where, you know, we're looking inward, um, there's a lot of, um, bless you, there's a lot of, you know, um, just antagonism when it comes to like outsiders and development and you know a lot of commitments when it came to uh, development maybe not so much in Germany but you know I spent 10 years in the UK and a lot of the um, the commitments that you thought would never shake they've been shaken and so re maybe that will change but if we if we're realist we we need to look at what happens if everything dries up and so there has to be people and structures there. And it, and it has to depend on development right now. That's just how it is. It has to depend on those investments. But we also need to really push the domestic, you know, resources to come out too. But, you know, it, it is complex because then there's a lot of, like, debt challenges after COVID-19. And so I think, you know, this, Gail, as you aptly said, this isn't an either or. But I do think we need to look to the future because it's just not sustainable to continue to kind of build these huge structures outside of countries that um, are con resource constrained at the moment. Yeah. May, may, but one quick response. I mean, when, when I said uh, it's not so difficult to understand what is right and what is r wrong, or we, at the same time, we must not be naive. Yeah. Uh, there are many things in the world where everybody knows what is wrong and what is uh, right, and still we have regulation in place. We have uh, we ensure that what is right uh, also happens in reality, and that's why I'm not absolutely not against it, on the contrary, to have MOUs or prior informed consent um, uh, agreements so that everybody knows this is what we agree on and that is outside what we have agreed.
Yes, and um, I, I also maybe want to clarify, I'm, 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 I think multilateralism is of course important, yeah, but I think that cannot be the fallback option for me um, because you have to have also, I think, partnerships on, on a national level, supporting really with national expertise and building this capacity. I think uh, there, there might be now with the economics changing in the world, be kind of a, a, a political tendency to uh, to push together the money that is there into something they can argue with into international organizations. And I think no, that should... On the contrary. Uh, the I'm contrary is happening. Go and discuss with all the international institutions. Yeah. And I'm not arguing against bilateral co cooperation, not at all, not at all. Uh, but we also need very solid uh, multilateral agents and yeah. they are sitting in the UN system. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but then I think then we're um, aligned, that's good. But talking about them, um, I mean, we, uh, you came now from, from a discussion, I think, on, on, the, um, on the Global Emergency Help uh, health um, corp now it's called mm -hmm. that's uh, part of the zero draft of the um, pandemic agreement that unfortunately discussed at the moment in the other um, in the other um, meeting in the panel um, that should bring together the different uh, players in a way on top of what we are doing already um, we have some more expectations in the um, in the in the um, in the in the agreement also on requirements to support countries um, that is already in Article 44 in the IHR. So how does that um, fit? Can you tell us a little bit um, on? It, it sounds like we're getting another mechanism <laughs> on top of all the different structures we are already uh, having and having to um, address and um, keep the fuel running. Yeah, so that, that was the reaction of most of the Go Iron Steering Committee, to be quite honest, when they first heard about this initiative was, oh no, you know, are we about to reinvent yet another network of networks when many of us have been in existence for two decades? Is that really what we need? But actually, it's, it's a, a pulling together of all the net, big networks that already exist, but this time very much putting at the countries in the driving seat. Um, and I think that's the change. It's, it's, it's looking at um, the situation in a different way. It's, it's about what do they need? They are going to lead. They will own it. And, and it's about um, national capacity building for rapid response. And that the networks such as, you know, GOARN and the EMTs, I mean, I, I can't really speak for my, my sister networks, but, um, you know, they would be involved more with training up those national capacities. Um, and then you've got IANFI, who's also a partner who, who obviously will lead more from the point of view of the National Public Health Institutes and establishing that longer term capacity. So um, I, I think, yeah, we probably um, are holding our breath a little bit to see how the governance will play out. I don't think that's been decided yet. But I, I think listening to the, the country representatives that were there, um, they can see um, the benefit in this was the impression I came away with. And they particularly like the focus on their sovereignty um, and that they are the lead. And it's, I think it's just a way of reframing the networks that already exist, but getting us to work better together for the sake of a common good. And I don't think that's a bad thing. That's, I mean, I think sovereignty is, is one of the core ideas, I think, of the agreement, and definitely that uh, would be helpful to bring that together. Um, from, do you have um, perspectives on that from more national, regional um, level, um, how these networks can really be better owned and guided by the national um, needs and um, wishes? No, I believe... Uh uh, is uh, my personal understanding of this uh, the GEC network is that is the network of networks is putting together all networks we are having UCNet, Corn, EMTs, and Yanfi and Coas uh, Response Team, Avoc, whatever we have as a network before we are putting them together, because what happens before was you have different. Pro for instance, from where I'm sitting, we have different training programs together coming from various networks. And we're using almost the same 
financial resources to address all those training. Even sometimes retraining, retraining the same people from one network to another network. So it is, it's a, really an opportunity for building consultants, consistencies in this existing system, building efficiency, and also providing uh, I, I really like a, a sentence from the Minister of Health from German say that they want the executive power to the countries, really giving the driving seats to the countries to really select what they want, the kind of response they want to deliver to the populations and how they want it to be delivered. So it's really empowering communities, empowering countries to be more effective for the uh, next outbreak or pandemic response. That's really uh, uh, what it's all about. Now we are, experts are still discussing on the best way to, because it's a lot, a huge number of organizations that should work together to deliver it. We are still discussing on the best ways, the best strategies to be more effective than we were before and how best we can encompass lessons we have learned from the pandemic response to, to uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic response to this initiative. Core points I have uh, uh, flag myself during the discussion was the multidisciplinary approach because in West Africa, for instance, at the time we were responding to the pandemics for expanding, for instance, detection capacities, it was animal health that provided the solutions. We were using animal health capacities, vet capacities to support surveillance, to support lab in the region. But when we are discussing now, the how to build the new architecture, they are no more around us. We are not having that kind of agreement between sectors now that will face the next pandemics. So it's all about that. It's about having all actors, all relevant stakeholders from different uh, sectors together to address the issues. The, another important point is the institu institutionalizations, as I said before. We were building, uh, we were establishing bodies, we were establishing teams, but we didn't work on how to sustain them, how to make sure that they are included in the national, uh, uh, I can say, structures to be stronger, to be able to get funding, to be able to be sustainable. So it's... I hope GEC will bring answers to all those challenges we are discussing in global health. Thank you. John. You, I mean, he mentioned, Virgil mentioned the um, multidisciplinary approach. I think uh, uh, you're also chairing the, um, the One Health um, Board on the um, Lancet Commission. So the, what do you think is, um, is the possibility or opportunity in, in this multidisciplinary and rapid response? Right. No, I think uh, very critical points uh, Virgil raised, and it brings to the fore the idea of a, a one health approach to, to health system strengthening. Now, when you think about it in terms of rapid response, I mean, it's rapid, and you, you, you emphasize this. It's a rapid response. Now, it, silent in there is also the word temporary, because it will not be rapid response all the time. It cannot be continuously rapid. It inherently, <laughs> it inherently means that it's a temporary response. Now, it is therefore unethical to engage in a rapid response without any recourse to sustainability of the impact of that, of that response. And I think this is where the multidisciplinary approach uh, really comes in, recognizing that if you want to sustain uh, the impact of your rapid response, uh, you need to have a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach uh, towards it. Um, that, that being said, um, um, even with this, um, uh, you know, rapid response, you think of the way countries like Cuba have provided support through the Cuba Medical Brigade. Uh, it's not a rapid response. It's a very long-term response. But the, the, the secret is they've embedded themselves within various national health systems. So you have the Cuban Medical Brigade, 
um, you know, found in various villages and, you know, centers, but they are part of the health system. There's no, this is the Cuba Medical Brigade mm -hmm. um, office. In fact, you hardly even see their vehicles. I've seen, I think I've seen the vehicle just once or twice. Um, uh, and, and they are part of the staff. You know, so that, that ability to, to integrate and have a long-term approach. But, I mean, rapid is very important, but then that connection with the sustainability is, is where I think uh, the, the needs to, 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 to be some, some emphasis and some, being a bit more deliberate on, on, on this sustainability, which, which means that right from the beginning, the focus should be on training to be able to operate on their own. She gave a beautiful example in Gozi of, of how Guinea took care of the next outbreak, you know, easy peasy, no, no, no trouble at all. They didn't need anybody because the capacity was now there. But the challenge now is post-COVID that many of these people who are trained are now being attracted elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't want to go there, but I've got to go there since you opened the door. Um, <laughs> with, with, you know, active, not passive, active recruitment mm -hmm. of trained staff yeah. Uh, I, I'm afraid of what will happen in many LMICs, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, should there be an outbreak. The capacity in terms of clinical staff to take care uh, in the event of a mass outbreak of some infectious disease is so decimated, it isn't, it isn't going to be funny at all. I mean, this is an understatement. The, 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 the rate at which, you know, experienced nurses and doctors and lab people, radiographers are just leaving yeah. uh, to many parts of the West is amazing. And uh, I mean, I, I can criticize the UK. I think I can do that uh, <laughs> for various reasons, <laughs> Gail knows. Uh, you know, they, they even think of lowering the cost of visas, you know, for, for nurses to make it easier mm. for them to go. Not to talk of all the middle men and women who are profiteering from the scams, but that's a whole different discussion. But, but we must bring all this in to really appreciate that if we want the impact of rapid response to be there uh, and for it to be ethical, then we need to think much, much wider than the immediate uh, problem. I think what you say I, is part of the neocolonial approach. Huh? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's part yeah. of the neocolonial approach. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Collecting mm -hmm. trained people um, definitely is part one part of it. I mean, what you're what you're mentioning, John, is definitely a huge challenge again because uh, I mean it's it's absolutely a, a huge issue, but it's putting a lot of um, expectations again on the rapid response teams as well, yeah, because there is some expectation to go and help fast, and then we have at the same time, yeah, we have at the same time the expectation to. Um, have that embedded into a good system, understand the system very well, um, have something there that lasts longer without that the provisions for necessarily the rapid response teams themselves have that in, 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 as, a, as an op option in a way, yeah? both from a personal capacity, also financial capacity, for example. Yeah? And I think it's not, it's not, I'm not arguing against it, I think it's necessary, but I would say that some of the structures that are established for the rapid response teams uh, need maybe to uh, be looked at um, how to adapt them also to to encompass these, these these longer lasting needs that are definitely there and that are um, that are questioned by by good reason by everyone that they have to be taken into consideration I, um, I think it's uh, uh, having worked in this area I really think I've faced very often, very competing expectations from yeah. different partners uh, and different uh, key key um, players, and that's uh, something we we mentioned some of them. But I think solutions to them are still a little bit um, challenging. We have five minutes left. Um, I'm not sure if you manage a one minute uh, wish for the rapid response teams when you have one wish or two wishes you want to. Uh, change over the next couple of uh, years or to to think of what is relevant, what would you give us um, at hand? Do you have any ideas? Those who have the first one can start. Just, um, just a, a few sentences at, at the end. I think um, what, what we heard, uh, and again with uh, Ngozi's very good examples, uh, example that at the end um, it is desirable um, that each and every country has a capacity to um, rapidly respond. 
uh, and that um, does not mean that we exclude the support by specialized rapid, uh, rapid response teams from other countries. But this should, uh, response should not, or these teams should not come from one uh, region of the world alone, uh, but uh, should be a, a two ways or multiple ways uh, track. That, uh, in a nutshell, uh, is what I'm take away from here. Excellent. Thank you. Gail, can you imagine being next? Uh, I don't want to, I'm usually an optimist, but. Um, <laughs> You know, when we live in a world that just seems to bounce from conflict um, to conflict and um, remains inherently selfish and doesn't consider enough of no pride nor ego, um, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, but if I could have a wish, I think it would be to for that change in global attitude and for us to genuinely mean it and realise that, you know, it is one world um, for all the reasons that we know that I'm not going to list. And, and until we actually, you know, our thoughts, thoughts determine words and words determine action. And so until we, until we truly start thinking differently, um, I'm probably going to be slightly in the pessimistic camp, but I'm going to dig deep and um, be an optimist and hope and pray that um, that change occurs and maybe even in our lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we need you to continue to be optimistic because <laughs> yeah. you're running a lot of things um, for us. Um, I think this was a great panel. I just have to say, um, I, I learned a lot, and I think my um, I think my one my wishes have been captured. But I guess I would add, I think it would be um, really good to understand what is the true local capacity of across countries. And I think we know a little bit. I know Nigeria CDC has done some work with like looking at their subnational subnational capacity um, and seeing those differences. But I think that would really be an important um, kind of resource for rapid response teams on the national, regional and international level. So that'd be good. Thank you. Well, I think they said it all. Not, not very much to add, except to say, um, I wish that rapid response uh, teams would take a step back and ask, why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, and I gave about four different, uh, you know, potential reasons. They will all still result in some people going to do some rapid response. But if we question why, I think, and this goes to what Gail was saying, it will lead us down different pathways, which would give us better results including, first of all, what Ngozi said, trying to understand what really is there. You may end up with the conclusion that actually we don't need to go. Mm -hmm. We just need to maybe do X, Y, and Z so that those there can take care of themselves. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I believe, uh, I think a lot has been said. Um, my last thought would be, would go for an advocacy actually for the institutionalization of uh, rapid response teams, mm -hmm. both in the north and in the south. One thing I have learned from this conference is that even in countries from the global north, these areas also is kind of neglected actually, because when you compare the allocated resources to rapid response team systems, even in the north, it's not enough themselves. I believe that it's a a matter of power relations, workforce, capacities, and also technologies to be managed by the world to address global health problems. So definitely, I'm saying national capacities as key, as somebody said before me, but I'm always saying negotiation around those four elements I have talked about. So. I really encourage Global South to learn from those factors, to be able to grab what they need to address the next pandemics that will occur, or outbreaks that will appear, that will occur. I support government to take the lead, the driving seat um, on this, in this discussion in a such a way that we deliver the human right base, the gender transformative outbreak response that's required by the global community. Thank you so much. Thank you.
then um, thank you for for bringing together all these ideas again. Thank you for a very I know, interactive uh, discussion, a hot discussion, and I hope not only because of the heat of the room, you all managed very nice. Um, thank you very much um, for joining us, and uh, I wish you a very nice evening and a nice reception. Bye-bye.